This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. I'm Andrew Reinhardt. I'm the Director of Publications for the American Numismatic Society, and I've had the pleasure these past several years to share an office across the way from David Hill when I was working in the New York office. So if you've ever been to the library, you know that it's uh, glass everywhere, and so I can just see him and he can see me working in my fishbowl. Uh, so David, hello from New Jersey. Um, for those of you who don't know David, he's been the ANS librarian since uh, 2010, if I remember correctly. And uh, not only does he uh, do the library and archives for the ANS, he's also oversees the satellite operation of the Newman Numismatic Portal. Uh, he's got over 25 years of experience working with books and archival materials, having held positions at the Columbia University Archives and uh, Columbiana Library, Berkshire County Historical Society in Massachusetts, Westchester County Archives, and a uh, College Library in New Rochelle, uh, New York. Uh, it's published widely. If you ever read the ANS Magazine, which I hope you do, um, you'll get uh, regular features and columns from David, um, which are, are a pleasure to edit because I don't have to do anything. He's an excellent writer and interesting topics. And speaking of interesting topics, we've got a doozy for you today with Long Table 89 on Shulman, Sultan, Frankenhus uh, in the uh, archival records. So without further ado, here's David Hill. Wow, thank you, Andrew. That was quite an introduction. I appreciate that. I should say that um, this was at one time your office and it is now this uh, basically our- I thought it looked familiar. Yeah, Studio A here. Um, yeah, I'm going to just get right underway here after that. I mean, what, what's left to say as an introduction? Okay, the, as uh, Andrew said, I'm also the, uh, the librarian. I've been uh, the archivist here at the ANS since 2010, uh, but the librarian since uh, 2014. So I have been working with the archives here for over a decade. And we have plenty of interesting um, collections here in the ANS archives. And uh, two of the most interesting that we have are, oops, okay, uh, the Virgil Brand and the Garrett uh, records or papers documenting two of the um, uh, biggest and uh, most important collections that were assembled uh, in the United States. And so Virgil Brand um, briefly was a, a brewer and um, he came from a family of brewers in Chicago and he built up one of the biggest collections ever, 350,000 coins. Uh, the Garretts, um, they were collectors um, beginning with uh, T. Harrison Garrett, uh, who was the son of Robert Work Garrett, who was uh, started the uh, principal in the uh, B&O Railroad in Baltimore. And um, so T. Harrison Garrett started this collection, and then it passed down to his sons, John Work Garrett and uh, Robert Garrett. And then it was John Work Garrett that really expanded the collection. And um, interestingly, uh, we have a letter from Henry Chapman. It, it, these two, two, two huge collections could have combined because um, there's a letter from Henry Chapman in the Garrett uh, papers uh, where uh, Henry Chapman wrote to um, Garrett offering to sell uh, Garrett uh, Virgil Brand's collection. So this could have been, well, you know, two big collections could have become one massive collection. Anyway, we have the records uh, of these two groups, and I always like to put in my little plug for the Newman Numismatic Portal. All of these records are available, uh, for most of the part. The records, are available. The, uh, uh, the records are available through the Newman Portal, the Garrett uh, records, as well as uh, Virgil Brand, particularly uh, the notebooks that he meticulously kept over the course of uh, 40 years in the second half of the 19th century. Um, so, this is kind of a, a segue into um, talking about uh, the Schulmans, uh, particularly Moritz Schulman, um, who, interestingly enough, um, in he was part of the Schulman firm that was basically started in uh, in um, the Netherlands in um, eighteen eighty, um, and then this is moved to the, this was started by Jacob Schulman. And then um, this second generation is uh, his uh, sons, Moritz and Andre. And here's we have a letter from um, 
Moritz. Uh, actually, he was handling uh, the brand's coins, and at one point he um, was offering to find he, what he had hoped was that he could find somebody like Archer Huntington, perhaps, that could buy this and uh, have uh, this collection of uh, brands uh, reside at the ANS. So this was something that um, Maurice Schulman was involved in. So we, you can see here, he says something here about I had word from the brand's brothers and they're discussing everything. And um, they were really hoping that uh, he's writing to the secretary here, or Sidney Noe, hoping that these could um, be somehow purchased and placed at the ANS. Um, another kind of interesting uh, uh, thing in the, the, we have a lot of records of Moritz Schulman um, going back to, he, he became a member in 1915. And we, we do have a lot of letters back and forth about him. This is just one very interesting one about him talking about um, Henry Chapman, who is kind of an interesting character anyway. He's a lot of these numismatists, you read their letters, there's a lot of kind of gossipy stuff in there that's fun to read. Um, apparently, Henry Chapman was kind of spreading some rumors about uh, Moritz Schulman, and he wasn't quite sure who was spreading these rumors that during World War I, he was acting as a front for Germans trying to sell coins. So he says here, um, Howland Wood, one of our curators, was helping him out trying to figure out who was uh, spreading these scurrilous rumors. So he writes to him and says, I'm grateful about what you um, told me about that Philadelphia dealer, um, speaking, uh, talking about Henry Chapman. So he said, you'll cer certainly be astonished to hear that he not only has uh, told these base stories, but that he's also written in the same way to dealers in Paris. So he was accused of spreading all these kind of rumors. Uh, he says, I've always considered the man to be the most narrow-minded dealer I know, notwithstanding uh, he thinks he's the smartest fellow uh, on earth. And then he goes on to talk about he's going to try and clear this up and clear his name. Um, Schulman, um, Maurice Schulman, like I say, he joined the ANS in 1915, and he even came to the ANS uh, kind of during those years, during the war years of World War I. He came and he spoke at the ANS and he talked about um, how the tragedies of World War I, but he also um, spoke about how much, uh, you know, he, he understood the, the, the uh, troubles of World War I, but um, that this was also causing a lot of kind of uh, budding uh, fields of numismatics to pursue, uh, like prisoner scripts and necessity money and this sort of thing. So he gave a speech, and so you know, Maurice Schulman was kind of a worldly guy, and he was uh, would, he was he was back and forth in the United States. But in 1919, he had trouble uh, leaving the Netherlands, and he. Uh, was trying to come visit, I believe, yeah, he was trying to sail to Washington here, and you can see that um, it was decided to be unfavorable that he couldn't come. Uh, there was nothing personal against him, but that the business of coins and metals wasn't to be considered to be urgent. So this is kind of interesting, just, I mean, this is just the usual kind of bureaucratic nonsense that people are up against and try and uh, get past, but um, it was really kind of a foretaste of what uh, Moritz Schulman would encounter 20 years later, um, it's a much more serious uh, efforts um, on the part to keep him from traveling and the serious consequences that this uh, had. And so some of this, um, this story is what I stumbled upon one time when I was preparing actually the uh, Schulman, uh, I'm sorry, the, um, the Garrett papers for um, scanning for the uh, Internet Archive, I mean, for the Newman portal. And um, so, you know, the Garrett records and the Garrett and the brand papers uh, can be uh, full of all kinds of useful information about coins, for sure, because there's all kinds of information about uh, the buying and selling of coins. Um, so you can use them to trace provenances and all kinds of stuff. But there's always these other kind of stories that are often hidden in there. And one of them uh, is this story, this tragic tale of Moritz Schulman. Uh, this is his son, Hans Schulman. Um, 
Hans Schulman came to the U.S. to travel. He, he kind of had a, some lucky timing here because he came to the U.S. in uh, 1939 to do some uh, studying and to conduct some business. But uh, while he was over here, Germany invaded Poland in late uh, 1939. And he's, he wrote back, you know, his, his correspondence is in there and says, you know, it's getting, things are getting pretty heated up over there. And so um, I, I, sh I won't be returning anytime soon. Now you see, uh, this is a great picture of Hans Schulman, and I'll say I, I uh, plan to talk about three different cases today. Uh, the thread through all of them is Hans Schulman. He actually shows up in all three of these stories. Uh, when you talk to people about Hans Schulman, everybody has these great memories of, of him. Uh, they remember him as a fine, uh, just a very um, kind of vivacious personality. I think he was, I'm told he was a great sto storyteller. He, everybody always kind of smiles about his own antics. Uh, in fact, um, I'm going to talk about, if we get to it today, Mark Schulten, uh, Sultan, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, he tells a little story in there. Mark Sultan was very um, uh, complimentary of the Schulman family, and uh, he, was, he had great respect for uh, Hans's father, Moritz. And uh, you find these stories uh, a lot of times about the, um, Hans Schulman. Um, and Sultan tells a few of these. He, there's always talk of uh, Hans Schulman and his uh, various wives. And uh, Mark Sultan tells some story about, um, I, I don't know the veracity of any of these stories, but he talks about how um, somehow, uh, there's a whole story, but Hans, Hans Schulman, uh, had had many uh, dealings with um, King Farad of Farouk of um, Egypt, and um, when King Farouk uh, abdicated in 1952, Han, he apparently he owed Hans all kinds of money. Uh, I've seen this figure: three hundred fifty thousand dollars, a million dollars. So he he kind of is notorious for that uh, period of his life, and somehow. Mark Sultan tells this story about how when he was trying to get out of, I believe it was when he was then trying to get out of the country with some coins and he didn't have the proper documentation. There's some story about how he was put in jail and then one of his wives found out about one of his other, uh, you know, dalliances and ended up, um, his, the wife went home and ended up clean, cleaning out his bank account. Um, and this is all Mark Sultan's, uh, I'm getting this from Mark Sultan's story. Um, and also that somehow Hans was thrown in jail at this time, but I've also read that perhaps it was not so much a jail as, as, as just being detained in a nice uh, hotel. Um, in any event, Hans Schulman kind of plays, kind of shows up a lot of times when you're looking in the uh, correspondence relating to these sorts of things in the mid 20th century. Uh, he, like I say, he came to the US in 1939 and he started issuing his own uh, first catalogs here in 1940. Um, I, I mentioned John Work Garrett. So John Work Garrett was the collector. Um, he was a diplomat, um, a career diplomat. He was an ambassador to Italy at, at one point from 1929 to 1934. Uh, this is his home here, Evergreen, which came down through the family. Um, and this is now a museum and historical site that you can visit. Um, well, Hans Schulman started to see that uh, his father and his family was in great danger over in Holland. And um, Hans Schulman started to write to uh, John Work Garrett uh, at, at Moritz Schulman's uh, urging, actually. So there's a bunch of letters in there about Hans Schulman writing and trying to get John Work Garrett, the diplomat, to assist with getting his uh, father, his mother, and his sister out of uh, Europe. And you know, it starts off, it's, this is 1940, and he says the family in Amsterdam has been well, father's been able to continue his business as before, things are not so bad, real changes have not yet occurred, he says. Uh, my father wrote to me today that he'd very much like to visit the country uh, to take care of his affairs. You know, this is all, all of this kind of thing is all very chilling, you know, when you 
learn what happens later. You know, but things just kind of start off like, yes, my father would kind of like to get out of the country. Let's see what we can do. You know, and then and then he kind of goes back and forth, and it starts to get a little more alarming as he, on Hans's end as he moves on, and he's going, he's kind of struggling uh, against these bureaucratic walls that he keeps running into, and and these kind of things are always very difficult for everybody to deal with. In a life and death situation like this, it's particularly alarming. So he's he's just writing his, you know, I don't know which way of acting. He's being told many different uh, ways to pursue this, trying to get the proper documentation. He's, you can see his frustration here. Are you able to advise me what I can do now? If I could follow the exact advice of the printed information and acquire these visas, uh, I wonder when my father will get one. So he's, he's trying to, you know, he's getting these forms. He's trying to fill out these forms. And um, John Work Garrett is, is successfully putting him in touch with some of these people um, that he was hoping could help him. And in fact, um, he puts him in touch at one point with um, a particular diplomat that had been able to get Sigmund Freud out of Aust Austria. Um, but you know what happens is Hans um, becomes more and more kind of urging and frustrated. Um, but it, it, it seems that after a while, it just seems like uh, Garrett really can do nothing for him. He kind of puts him in touch with people. And then you do get the impression uh, that uh, Garrett was really not kind of understanding the gravity of the situation uh, entirely because um, he starts to ask Hans Schulman about things like, you know, I, I sent 50 cents to your firm for a catalog. I haven't gotten it yet. You know, you, this, these kinds of like things that are, you know, when Hans is dealing with these life and death type situations really don't really matter much. So the last letter between the two comes in about December of 1940. And in 1940, in the Netherlands, the um, Germans began, had begun uh, rounding up the Jews and starting to um, concentrate on Amsterdam. And, and you know, it began exporting into the camps. Um, and Moritz and his wife, tragically, uh, were sent to Sobibor extermination camp in occupied Poland, uh, where they were killed uh, three days after. You can see that they were sent here uh, in June 29th, 1943. And these cards are available online, I think, through a, uh, efforts of the Red Cross and others. A lot of these archival documents are all available online. Um, and sent here on uh, 6-29-1943, and then were um, killed uh, three days later. So I'm going to move on to another uh, subject at this point, but does anyone have any questions uh, about the uh, Garrett or Schulman or any of that? Okay. Um, all right, so I want to talk about Maurice Frankenhaus. Um, he was a collector of um, World War medals, beginning in World War I and then into World War II, and he was a collector of many different things, actually. And you can see um, this medal from his collection. His collection was given to the Eretz uh, Museum in Tel Aviv. Um, this medal here is by uh, Walter Eberbach, and it shows death here with a, holding a mine and a torpedo. And this is uh, the, the sinking of the Dutch vessel Tubantia, um, which it was a propaganda medal done by the Germans, kind of blaming the uh, British for this, uh, falsely blaming the British for the sinking of this uh, um, of this. Uh, uh, luxury liner, I believe, uh, from the Netherlands. Um, so how I came into this story, I, I, happened to, I was working on the Schulman uh, material that I was just talking about and had just written an article about the Schulman uh, story. And um, 
I came upon this folder. This crossed my desk at the time when I was working on the other story. And um, it was fascinating. Um, and it had this name Frankenhaus in there. And um, part of this folder here contains a transcript of a CBS special that was aired in, um, on CBS in the 1960s. Um, called Out of the Ashes. And this is all part of a big effort to, uh, there was a feeling at the time that people didn't know enough about the Holocaust. And there was, a, you know, it's kind of 20 years on and people were um, wanting to, to um, get the, the story out there more than it had been. And in it is, um, a, a, like I say, a transcript of this, but also a description of it done by, who, tur who turned out to be, um, Frankenhaus's daughter, Julia. And so I, I contacted, you know, I said, I, there's, I didn't know much about this. Uh, I couldn't find out much about uh, Frankenhaus, but I was fascinated when I was reading all of this. And I thought, I've got to find out more about um, Maurice Frankenhaus. So I wrote to the Eretz Museum and they wrote back and said, uh, well, okay, yeah, uh, we can tell you some stuff about him, but you know, his grandson lives in the New York area, Aaron Oppenheim. And I said, oh, well, that's great. So I, I got in touch with Aaron Oppenheim. I think I wrote him an email. And this was very confusing to Aaron because I, um, he, it turns out he had been here at the ANS um, three days prior to this, I think it was. Um, so when I wrote to him, uh, he, was, he was writing back saying, oh, you mean like, is this on, based on the topic like I was discussing when I was at the ANS three days ago? It, he was meeting with our curator, curators, uh, Peter Van Alphen, and to talk about Maurice Frankenhaus and his collection. So we cleared this up and um, we finally uh, cleared it up and he invited me up to, to his home to view Maurice Frankenhaus collection and some uh, archival materials that he had. Uh, it turned out to be just a real trove of stuff uh, that I, his, he welcomed me into his home, uh, his uh, very warm reception from his uh, wife and daughter and him. And I spent the day looking over these materials that he had and uh, was able to put together this fascinating story about Maurice Frankenhaus. Now, this is Aaron here. Aaron was gonna be with us today and it's one of the reasons we're recording this today is he, he was unable to make it. Um, but here he is as a boy, uh, called him Ronnie. And here he is with his grandfather, whoops. Um, okay, so I said that um, Maurice was a collector of metals. And so even uh, way back in World War I, well, just after World War I, he published this uh, uh, book on his metal collection. Uh, of World War II. So here he is kind of around that same time. Um, but he collected many other things. Uh, um, actually, these are, he did collect uh, World War I metal uh, posters. Um, and he collected note geld and uh, prisoner script and all kinds of things. In fact, he was an inveterate collector. He's just never stopped collecting things. Um, in any event, this, uh, these two posters actually relate to the, his World War I collection of medals he would um, display uh, in different places, and he would have these uh, posters made. So you can see this co uh, collection of Frankenhaus here in 1918. And then at the same studio here, he was going to um, show these 20 or so years later, um, but um, 30 years later, but they, um, I, I, it's my understanding this, uh, this particular show never took place. Um, the Frankenhaus family was in uh, cotton and um, fabrics. This was their business. And he was born in Germany, but he was, because his parents were in, from the Netherlands, he was also a citizen of the Netherlands. And he studied in England and learned the cotton business there. And here he is, um, he kind of um, sarcastically said in one of his um, letters, and um, 
documents. He, he would kind of type, type up these documents about his life, these little biogra bio biographic details about his life. And he's kind of uh, sarcastically saying here he's, he's committing the crime of buying kosher chickens here in this particular picture. But this is from, I think, 1940. And um, already things were kind of turning. And uh, Aaron, I know, says he, he sees a look of concern on his grandfather's face that maybe not on the uh, faces of his daughters here. Uh, Julia, the older one, and then Bertie here, um, the younger one. Um, so um, Germany invaded the Netherlands. They were living in The Hague. Um, and Germany invaded the Netherlands on May 10th of 1940. And uh, Maurice talks a lot about this in his uh, remembrances that he has put together. Um, he tells very detailed stories about what was going on that night, the bombings, the running out of the house, uh, trying to figure out what was going on, trying to kind of escape from the area at one point. Um, this family here lived very close by, uh, the Schapp family, and it was his brother's wife's brother's family. And after this um, invasion in, of May 10th, um, everyone was shocked when Queen Wil Wilhelm Wilhelmina um, uh, uh, fled Holland. Uh, I think. A couple of days after the invasion. And so you can see this coin here, this altered coin that's kind of mocking that. And it says Wilhelmina in uh, London. It's been changed, uh, the, the text on there, and she's got this kind of helmet on here. Uh, the, the, the altered coin is in um, the Frankenhaus collection. Um, the one on the left is just an ANS coin, uh, the way it was issued. Now this family here, the Shep family, they lived, uh, I get the impression, in the, either in the same building or maybe next door to the uh, Frankenhaus family, being that they were in-laws. Uh, they decided once, the, when the queen fled to England, that they would take their lives. So they all, uh, the family uh, committed suicide. And so d amongst all this, you know, they were kind of dealing with this family uh, and having to deal with this um, tragic outcome. Um, while they were also trying to just find out what was even happening as the as the whole country was came under attack. So this is um, some of the uh, collection that um, Aaron showed me when I got to the house. A lot of the stuff is uh, uh, actual artifacts that are in these boxes and um, you know, it's amazing to read about Maurice uh, because he collected so much and he had, he, he describes it as, I think it was 23 crates of material that he had stored uh, underground during the war. Um, like I say, he had something like uh, 10,000 uh, war posters. And when he, after the war, when he went back to get this stuff, he was able to recover maybe 5,000. But I mean, it was just kind of nonstop collecting and um, to even collect 5,000 war posters is like a, a major job. So he still has some of this stuff left and, and there's been a lot of donations over the years that Maurice made um, of his collection. Uh, you know, some of these signs, I mean, he himself said that as he was, even in, in circumstances where he was fleeing uh, some camps, he would be grabbing things. And he said, he himself said, who else would do this, but like a, a, just someone so devoted to collecting. So uh, these signs are in the collection. Uh, I'm not sure where he got them. These are basically restricting Jewish movement uh, signs and that sort of thing. There's his, um, he did all these, like I say, these reminiscences and letters and this sort of thing. They're all in these uh, notebooks that uh, Aaron very graciously shared with me. And this is the sort of thing you can see. I mean, he would just take, I mean, you just see the time that he devoted to this. And it was all based on remembering. Uh, and the collecting was all based on remembering. He just, he, he wanted to get every detail down. 
And so he would spend a lot of time just putting together these documents uh, as a way of remembering. In one of the books, uh, the, the Frankenhouses went into hiding for the first couple of years um, until they were betrayed, uh, basically. And so in one of his um, notebooks, is what, it, what this is is basically a flap over a picture. So he, he found out who this betrayer was and um, couldn't even look at this uh, photograph. Um, so it's covered here with this, you know, person who betrayed us. Turns out there's a, um, turns out it was, I, I believe if I'm understanding this correctly, a friend of um, the individual who was, whose house they were actually staying in when they were in hiding. Uh, I think it was uh, the son's friend or something like this. Um, it turns out that this is the picture under there. This was the betrayer, um, JJ Limburg. Um, this isn't, I, Aaron was just telling me this story um, a couple of days ago. So this is kind of, this story is kind of new to me that apparently Aaron had always wondered, well, how did he have this guy's picture? So very typical of Maurice Frankenhaus. Um, he really worked very hard to figure out who betrayed the family. So he had some ideas and he started to enlist these other people to help out. And there was were almost like an investigative team um, that he went to and they exchanged letters. And um, this team is almost like a, you know, almost like a Nazi hunting type of thing um, where they, this team uh, that he went to and worked with and wrote letters to worked very hard to kind of document a lot of this stuff. So you, You'd see on this team here, and and this Aaron was just telling me this story the other day. He had no idea, so he he kind of stumbled into this these letters that his grandfather had written about this, and he's he see, he sees that they had writing to this team Hess, you know, this uh, Peter and Ellie Hess. And he's like, who are these people? So he he did a little bit more investigating. It turns out Ellie Hess is Hans Schulman's sister, so um, she remained very active. Uh, after the war, um, trying to track down uh, Nazi criminals and and you know people like this uh, person who had betrayed the um, Frankenhaus family. Uh, Maurice Frankenhaus, um, when he was in hiding. He talks about uh, buying writing paper for with you know trading scraps of uh, potato potatoes and this sort of thing. Uh, he kept a bunch of notebooks in kind of a code and kind of the, using these pictures to try and remember uh, what had happened and what uh, and so that he could tell the story um, when the war was over. Uh, one of the things he kept in his collection was his war uniform. So here he is showing that in a picture. Four years after he um, was interred at um, the Westerbork camp, he returned, and the camp commandant uh, was then a prisoner there, Gemmiker. And he went back and he interviewed him. Now, he didn't tell him that he was a had been a prisoner there and he tried to act kind of uh, nonchalant on this and he was interviewing um, the commandant and uh, you know he describes this this is a man who you know at one point time had velvet chairs and he would attend the theater here the, the Westerbork theater or whatever but now he was kind of like his fingers were stained from peeling potatoes you know because he was just a criminal so they brought him in and Maurice is kind of grilling him a little bit but he never kind of lost his composure uh, until this Gemmiker started talking about, you know, referring to Auschwitz as uh, just a work camp and this sort of thing. And then Maurice really couldn't control himself any longer. And he was, you know, he, he just talked about the miserable conditions and packing uh, people into cattle cars and this sort of thing. But 
this uh, Gemmerker didn't seem really to uh, kind of moved by any of it. And in fact, he, he, Gemmerker kind of got up pretty lightly. He, he was sentenced to 10 years and he served six only. And um, he died in 1982. When the um, Frankenhouses were in hiding, his youngest daughter kind of put together this somewhat uh, numismatic um, presentation. So this is uh, Bertie, and she decided that she wanted to make three medals. So she was able to go out and cobble together what kind of artistic supplies that she could and created these uh, medals uh, in wood and these presentation boxes. And these were all done for the three daughters, the princesses, basically, uh, daughters of the queen, which she had hoped at one time she could um, present to them. Um, so the one in the middle was for Beatrix, which uh, Beatrix later became uh, the queen. Um, and this actually, Beatrix later on, um, Maurice, talked about these medals and Beatrix later married um, what what uh, Maurice said was in, in 1966 she married uh, what Maurice said was a member of um, Hitler's elite corps core is what he said and so he, he was kind of uh, put off by this and he said the and the medal in the middle he kind of reevaluated himself and he said this could be seen as the scrawny scrawny prancing lion could well represent the youthful Klaus von Amberg, who was uh, uh, Beatrix's uh, groom, as he rampaged through Italy. You know, so he kind of sees this medal in a whole different way, this scrawny lion prancing its way through Italy. This, um, this Frankenhaus story and this story of the, the medals got a little bit of uh, Coin World Press in, in the 1960s. So there's a bunch of Coin World articles on this topic. Um, and in those years, uh, Margot Russell, the editor of Coin World, came to visit um, Maurice and Ronnie. And um, in, a, in typical kind of Maurice fashion, he really went over the top here with his welcoming of her and created almost this kind of shrine to have her come in. But this, you really get the sense that this is the way that uh, Maurice Frankenhaus kind of uh, did everything. He, he seemed to be very full of life. I know Aaron remembers him as, as kind of laughing. You know, it's all these grim stories that we talk about, but it, he remembers him laughing and he remembers him laughing in particular with shows like uh, I Love Lucy and this sort of thing. So he just had like a, a great love of life, really, it seemed. And but, though devoted to um, trying to remember these horrible years. Uh, Maurice put out this medal um, called Tribute to the Six Million Martyrs um, in 1967. And the, the, it's um, done by Elizabeth Weistrup. The obverse here is really based on his own family, his wife, two daughters here. Um, Aaron reissued it in 1983 with a, uh, the different reverse that you see here. And here we have Hans Schulman again. And Hans Schulman was um, at, the, at the, this is in front of Hans Schulman's shop here, and they were selling uh, the Frankenhaus metal. Um, and in fact, um, most of the metals came from the Schulmans. It turns, it comes out in the correspondence. Like I say, Maurice. Um, Frankenhaus um, devoted his life to uh, remembering. And so this is, a, there's a whole series of these photographs of him um, in, this is in a Times Square theater in 1966, and they're th showing the movie, uh, The Secrets of the Nazi Criminals. And so what he would do is kind of stand out here and engage people as they walked by and maybe trying to entice them to go in and see this. And um, there's a whole bunch of these photographs. Uh, and so he was kind of tirelessly working 
uh, to remember. Okay, so he died in 1969. Any questions on this segment? All right. Let me just... Um, I'm a little confused by the Limber the Limburg story. He died in a okay. concentration camp. Okay, the Limburg story is pretty confusing, and it's one that I just heard a couple of days ago. Um, there is the story is we're learning that he, um, even though he betrayed the Frankenhouses, he then maybe went to work for um, the underground resistance, the Germans. And then he was um, killed by them, firing squad. And so his name shows up on a memorial um, to those who resisted. Mm. Um, there may be more to that story, but that is uh, kind of where it stays, uh, as far as I know. Okay. I think he, I think he kind of um, switched over. Okay. And yeah. Then, the, yeah. There's a there's a Dutch website which lists him, including yeah. his uh, imprisonment and and death. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is all uh, literally yesterday. I was kind of getting this story. Okay. Uh, any other members of the Frankenhaus family survive? Yes. Uh, in fact, I, I, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. The, the, yeah, in fact, um, they all survived, um, the Frankenhaus family. So Julia and Bertie, uh, Julia is um, Aaron's mother. Um, Bertie, I have this here, was oh, let me see here. Yeah. Okay. So Bertie later became a professor of microbiology and immunology in Upstate Medical Center in Syracuse. So yeah, Maurice talks about when he toured Westerbork, he gave great thanks and prayer for the survival of his family, for the survivor, survival of his family when he encountered the, you know, the place where they had been kept. So yeah, they were survivors. Any other questions in there in the chat? Yeah, Garrett yeah. Help? It seems that uh, the question is, did Garrett help? Um, uh, he tried, you know, he basically did what he could to put people in touch, uh, to put them in touch with the right people. But there was really nothing I don't think that he really could have done for them. He just gave them advice. He tried some back channels a little bit, but it didn't really help. Okay, so. All right, Mark and Lottie Sultan. Now I know we talked about uh, Mark and Lottie Sultan in a long table just a couple of weeks ago. So I don't think that uh, much of what I say will be too redundant. Um, this is probably this, oops, uh, can I go back? Yeah, this is probably a picture taken in the 1960s uh, when Mark was a director at the Manufacturers Hanover. Um, Mark died in, in 2006, and Lottie died in 2020. And the papers came here at that time uh, through much help from um, executors, Ira Rizak, and uh, uh, ANS curator, Alan Stahl, and um, also a great help from Norman Pepin, who helped put a lot of this stuff together uh, at their apartment up in Hartsdale. Um, uh, 
Uh, Mark Sultan was born Max Schlesinger, and he uh, changed his name later. And uh, when he came to the U.S. after the war, and he was convinced by others that this would be a good idea, but he always regretted changing his name. And when he uh, later in life would give gifts to the um, ANS, they would uh, be in his father's name. So he really tried to perpetuate the name, um, having regretted changing it himself. Um, he, Mark, there's in, his, in these papers, uh, I, I, I do want to emphasize that these papers, these are, these are the papers that I, the part, the section of this, you know, there's 20 plus boxes of these materials. Um, you know, this, I found these kind of interesting stories in here, um, and these tragic and nightmarish stories, um, but it's not the majority of the papers. Actually, a lot of these materials are, uh, have to do with coins, and there's a lot of stuff in here that can be used for provenance of coins and all kinds of, a lot of more stories left to be told. So this is just really what I've concentrated on up to this point. Um, in here, Mark does have some remembering of his uh, father, Felix Schlesinger, and remembered him as a violinist and his, a lover of opera, in particular uh, Verdi, uh, somebody who took to languages very readily um, in learning them. He, uh, uh, Felix started his business in Frankfurt and then uh, moved to Berlin, and then in 1935 to Amsterdam, and his last catalog was done in 1941. Oops. Um, they first made contact from what I found with the ANS in 1930, and the ANS bought some books from his firm. And uh, our secretary, Sidney Noe, wrote back and said, I'm trusting that this first contact uh, with your firm will be the beginning of a long and mutually successful business uh, acquaintance. Um, but really, even by then, uh, things were starting to turn uh, in Europe. There are a bunch of these uh, documents about having to, from Omnia here, this kind of uh, trust company that was put together by the Nazis to liquidate these uh, Jewish firms that were they didn't need. And so they went in, in and looted them and um, set up this kind of bureaucratic uh, way of handling uh, this uh, to the point of taking a um, the, taking over a Jewish banking, uh, the Jewish bank to transfer uh, some of this stuff to not alarm too many people, you know, going under this trusted uh, Jewish bank name. Uh, so there's a lot of this kind of bureaucratic paperwork uh, that uh, kind of that they used to, to track this sort of looting. And these are original documents. So the reason that some of these documents were preserved is that um, Mark's brother Paul had made it to Palestine uh, during the war. And when he came back into the uh, office, um, he, he went back to the um, ransacked offices basically after the war. And some of the papers were still in there along with some of the collections. Um, the Nazis, as I said before, invaded uh, the Netherlands in, in 1940. Um, this, these two documents here are, these are basically what happened here is, uh, this one has to do with the opening of, forced opening of the safe. Uh, by this point, um, Felix Schlesinger had been taken. I mean, there's something very nauseating about this idea. You just take somebody out of a situation and pack them off and send them off. And then you start to just force your way into their safe and take everything you want. And, um, you know, this kind of uh, official uh, paperwork that goes along with it is all uh, very unpleasant to um, deal with. So you have the two um, uh, basically um, locksmith uh, opening his safe. Um, Felix had been, this is September of uh, 1943. Felix had been sent off, taken, sent off to the camps in 1943. Um, 
And this is the liquidation of the company here in July 31st, 1944. Um, and so this is July 1944. Um, and you can see that Felix and his wife here uh, were murdered a few months later in um, October 25th, 1944. So you can see Auschwitz here, all right here. This is the trans from Theresienstadt uh, transfer here, probably. Um, and so, you know, once uh, they're out of the picture, the full looting can take place. As I say, Mark Schlesinger changed his name. Max Schlesinger changed his name to uh, Mark Sultan. Uh, he was in, working with the resistance in the underground in uh, Lisbon, probably at the time this was taken. Um, after the war, he started up correspondence again with the Schul. I mean, they were close to the Schulman family in um, Amsterdam, and um, the Schulmans took care of a lot of this coin stuff. Uh, during the war and and helping Mark after the war, he would communicate with Jacques Schulman uh, to, um, to handle some of the coins that were left and to sell some of the other coins. Um, I'm gonna move along a little faster now. I'm realizing we're getting close here. Um, there's in particular this Hans Schulman had talked about um, being able to, to have salvaged some of the coins that were left or, or else um, the um, Schlesingers had left some coins with the Schulmans. Um, uh, Jacques Schulman talks about saving this particular coin here. Um, this Dutch uh, Rose Noble of Compen. Um, was one of the gold coins. The, the, the Schlesingers were forced to enumerate all their gold coins. And um, this one, Schulman said that he literally saved this from the, um, from the melting pot. And this, this, this particular coin caused a great deal of tension for these two over the next five years, actually. They would write back and forth about this coin. Uh, Mark Sultan said in one piece of correspondence, I remember him saying, I have no... Uh, you know, I have no um, heartfelt attachment to this coin, um, but, you know, they just kind of went back and forth on this coin and, and um, they wanted to sell it and uh, nobody, they couldn't agree. Um, Jacques Schulman felt that he should be compensated. Um, I, I found this coin in a Glendinning catalog. Um, you know, he's writing, one, at one point it was in the possession, I think they were going to sell it, uh, and it was in... Um, Leonard Farrar's uh, hands there briefly. You know, this is, as you know, so this is um, Mark writing, as you know, this piece was on our property before the war and it's been sent to you in approval and given back to us. Um, so like I say, they kind of fought over this and, you know, at some point, um, Mark got pretty upset and he said, this is your reasoning is absurd. Uh, this is highly unjust, you know, uh, Jacques wanted kind of a cut of this for his having saved this. He said, so then uh, Mark goes on to say, you were fortunate enough to be able to stay in Holland during the occupation. Others lost life and property. You should not try and profit excessively from the sad happenings of the recent war, he was told. This is Mark writing to Jacques. So these two were kind of at an impasse. And of course, uh, here we have Hans Schulman again. Kind of stepping in as the go-between between uh, these two. Hans Schulman was um, Jacques Schulman's cousin. And he says here that how he saw Mark Sultan and that Mark Sultan, you know, regretted that these troubles that had been caused. And he it basically sounded like he was kind of sorry about this. And they kind of seemed to smooth things over. Um, the thing about this coin is um, in my reading of these documents, I believe that they sold this coin. Um, do I have this number here? Yeah, I, I believed it was finally sold for about $700. And then he gave Jacques $250 of this. I, I found this in a document in 19, 
50. I, was, I, I have to admit that I was a bit surprised when to find that this coin was still in the Sultan collection when it was sold by Kunker. Uh, and this is one of the coins that they actually highlighted in their catalog. So I'm not quite sure uh, the disconnect there. But um, as far as I was concerned, they had finally sold this coin and, and worked this out. This is a uh, has to do with a library. Mark Sultan worked very tirelessly after the war. There's all kinds of documents in there trying to get compensation for his coin collection and for his uh, books. So this is a um, inventory that was done of the library in this you know beautiful professionally done uh, um, appraisal here. Um, is kind of also just such a kind of a tragic thing in particular for me to look at. You see kind of some of these Barclay head, you know, you, you see some of these books in here that you recognize and that I use on a daily basis compiling uh, records like this. But um, the reality is that by the next month of after compiling this um, uh, inventory here and appraisal, the books were in the hands of the Rosenberg Task Force, which was the Nazi group responsible for handling looted cultural property, and Felix had been shipped off three months later. So here's just another example of, you know, let's get this guy out of here, and then we can just, you know, let's list this, these books and um, sell them. Um, Sultan, Mark Sultan eventually came to, lived in New York, and they, he, you know, kept the Schlesing, Schlesinger name in his um, price lists when he was issuing them in the 1950s. Uh, Lottie Sultan also had an extraordinary story of fleeing into the night, taking care of her brother, Eric, for years, and um, She met and married Mark in 1948, and you know this is these silver dollars here. It was just Ira Rizek really felt that this uh, just kind of encapsulated kind of the generosity that he saw in Lottie. That these were kind of left over as little gifts that Lottie had had meant to give um, and never got a chance to, um, and so we made sure to keep those in the collection. Uh, in 1965, uh, the, the uh, Sultans, Mark and Lottie, um, were together became uh, collectors of um, Renaissance and Baroque medals. And there was a uh, exhibit in, in um, 1965 at Bowdoin College in Maine. And um, Lottie wrote the introduction to this, and I, I, I thought it was a nice little piece of work. So it was a great, um, I really thought that was um, well done. Um, and so there are materials in the collection having to do with that. Uh, Lottie established the Mark Sultan Lecture Series after his death in 2005. She left a bequest of $500,000 to help sustain a chair of medieval and Renaissance numismatics uh, when she died. And over the years, they gave seven, uh, 17, over 1,700 uh, coins and medals to the ANS, a lot, uh, as well as doing all kinds of other work on committees and um, working with the ANS for uh, decades. And that is the conclusion of what I have. Are there any other questions? Yes. David, can you hear me? Yes. David, hi. This is Al Bornaguro. Thanks for doing hey, this. Hey, Al. Um, oh, thanks. I, um, as you know, I've had an interest in the brand archive. And yeah. um, um, I'm wondering, a lot, a lot of the brand archive is uh, correspondence beyond the ledgers. And the ledgers, of course, have been digitized, and I've spent a lot of time with those. Yeah. Um, much of the correspondence is non-numismatic, you know, how they dealt with the real yeah. estate and all that. And there's mm -hmm. also a lot of personal correspondence, which is very revealing about the relationship within the family, but again, non-numismatic. But there is some stuff in there that is numismatic, in particular yeah. 
There are a couple of notebooks that I am quite certain belong to a Horace brand. Um, and I'm wondering if any of that got digitized. Not yet. Uh, we look at that stuff every so often. Some of it presents difficulties for us because of the size of it. Um, we can't do legal sized things. And a lot of I those are in legal size folders. Yeah. I, I think the Horace stuff is eight and a half by 11. I think it's, I know the brand ledgers, of course, are, yeah. are you can't do it in house. But I believe mm -hmm. um, the uh, Horace brand notebooks, I believe, are not oversized. I think they're eight and a half by 11, if I remember correctly. Yeah. I mean, I would have to look. I mean, if it's integrated with it, something like that, yeah, I would say. Um, you know, some of this stuff is all integrated together. So it's, you know, maybe you encountered it as you were going through it. But, um, you know, if it can and, be you know, done on its own. Yeah, at first blush, it almost doesn't look like it's numismatic. It's, you know, yeah. a typical Horace brand. It's yeah. very squirrely writing and crazy columns. And, and you know, yeah. you practically got to be a cryptographer to figure out what the heck it is. Um, but there's actually some useful material in there. But if you ever get a chance to look at it again, it might be worth a look. Yeah, I'll definitely take a look. I mean, I think about that stuff all the time, but it presents problems uh, that the other uh, notebooks and ledgers didn't present. Okay, so I have, what is, I'm sorry, I can't see this. And then below that. Okay, just okay. just, uh, just a real okay. quickie. Okay. Yeah, okay. That was very, very sobering and uh, hmm. extremely interesting. But David, you really, you don't stumble on things. I know you really look at them with a keen eye. And uh, what you bring forward is, uh, I don't know, it's just overwhelming. It's really good stuff. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thanks, appreciate Chuck. It. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Peter Sugar, hello. Did, hello, did you how are you? Question? Great yeah, to see well, you. I, good to see you. Thank you so much. It's quite interesting, sobering to be sure. I echo what Mr. Heck said. And um, this, I think Mr. Frankenheis was the one who collected the posters, who was an inveterate collector. And yeah. all those posters and stuff are now historical documents. Yeah, I, mean, I should say. Special, I yeah, and I don't know any Dutch. I don't know any German. I mean, I know a little French, but I could see that some of these things he must have picked up from, said he picked up from camps and other places. They may oh, be the only surviving. Yeah, but you know, they're very rare, or probably it's important that they survive to, to um, historicize, you know, the, these these horrors that happened to so many families uh, thank you so yeah. much no oh, thank you but um i should I, I don't think i mentioned that those posters uh were encountered in his uh, after he died he lived on the upper west side and you know west 80th street and those posters were in his apartment i believe and um aaron and his brother donated them to columbia so they're in the columbia okay. library collection okay that's that's very important that they have a a good place because I was thinking yeah. maybe Yad Vashem in Israel or someplace like that, but that's right. That's that's very important. Thank right. you for a telling me that. Yeah. What else? Somebody said something. No. Thanks again. Anyone else? Oh, my pleasure. Thank you for tuning in. Sure. Do you want to wrap up? Yeah. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Thank yeah. you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.